Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, depending on wherever you join us from. Uh, welcome to the Africa CDC weekly media briefing on uh, public health emergencies on the continent of Africa. Uh, as you aware, colleagues online and those in uh, physically in Zambia, uh, this briefing comes to you every week on Thursday at about this time, East African time, uh, where the director of Africa CDC uh, provide updates on all of the public health events across the continent. Uh, let me begin with an apology to you colleagues for a rather late start today, 15, 16 minutes of late start today. Uh, that is all because uh, the director, as you in, we indicated in the media adversary, is currently in Lusaka. As you can see, he's seated next to the DG, uh, Professor Raman Chilingi, the director general of the Zambia National Public Health Institute. Uh, so there's a big program happening there this week. Uh, which is a multi-country uh, COVID-19 vaccination campaign launch uh, for the Southern Africa region. And you are going to hear about all of the activities there under the SLL, that is the Saving Lives and Livelihood Program. So today we have with us our usual host, Dr. Ahmed Okwe Ohuman, the Acting Director of Africa CDC. And of course, as a guest and a host, because he's hosting the director as well, uh, Professor Roman Chilingi, the Director General of the Zambia National Public Health Institute. And of course, he's a special assistant to the president of the Republic of Zambia, specifically on health issues. So these two uh, panelists are going to be giving us update from the different events uh, uh, that will be proceeding uh, during the course of the weekend ahead of us. So without taking much of your time, let me hand you over to Dr. Ahmed Ogwell for our briefing on public health events, and then we will go to Professor Chilingi. Dr. Ahmed, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, those with us here physically in uh, Lusaka and those joining us online uh, to this press briefing today. Um, we have guests today, Professor Roma Chilingi, the Director General of Zambia National Public Health Institute, um, and he will be uh, giving us uh, um, uh, the reasons why we are here in, uh, in Lusaka for uh, this week, as well as some details around uh, the situation of COVID vaccination uh, in uh, Zambia. Uh, let's start by today. We have about 21 different public health emergencies and disease uh, outbreaks on the continent that um, we are um, uh, following up as Africa CDC. Um, but out of the 21, those that we've categorized as um, uh, public health emergencies of significance to discuss are eight. And out of those eight, uh, I will give you an update on four. And the four are uh, COVID-19, uh, the Ebola uh, outbreak in Uganda, the multi-country monkeypox outbreak across the continent, as well as a multi-country uh, outbreak of cholera across the continent. And I will start with COVID. Um, and today we will um, uh, make it a little bit more brief so that we can accommodate uh, the conversations with um, uh, Professor Roma Chelengi here. To date, we've documented uh, just over uh, 12.1 million uh, COVID-19 cases um, on the continent of Africa, which is uh, about 2% of the total number of cases that have been documented globally. We have uh, seen just over 11.4 million recoveries with unfortunately 256,066 deaths uh, on the continent. This means that um, um, out of every 100 people who we have documented as having COVID, two have passed away on the continent of Africa as a result of, uh, directly as a result of COVID. Um, these 256,000 deaths represent 4.1% of the total number of deaths due to COVID-19, and this means that uh, out of every 100 deaths globally, four are Africa's deaths. So it is quite significant in that sense. When we look at the trends 
uh, during epidemiological week 44, and that is the week 31st of October to the 6th of November. Um, and we compare that with the AP week 43, we see that we've documented a total of 5,378 new cases during that week, which is a 9% decrease when we compare with AP week 43. Um, and um, the highest proportions during this AP week 44, we have seen have come from the Southern Africa region with 34%. During the same period of AP week 44, we have documented a total of 60, that is six zero new deaths, um, which is um, uh, very similar to AP week 33, so uh, 43, so there is no change uh, in as far as trends of deaths uh, are concerned. When we look at the four-week period, that is um, the period starting 10th of October to the 6th of November, we see that on average, we have documented a 1% average increase in new cases on the continent. Um, and uh, we've documented an average 65% increase in the number of deaths. I must here add that um, due to batch reporting, which means countries give us information after several weeks, uh, that is why we see um, this uh, significant jump in the number of deaths. However, when we look at um, uh, the data carefully, we see that over the last month, um, there's only been a very slight increase in the number of deaths at um, uh, just about uh, 1% or thereabouts. So, the number of deaths have remained relatively stable compared to um, the four weeks before that. On COVID-19 vaccination, to date on the African continent, we have received a supply of 1 billion point uh, nine um, doses of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And we have administered um, 766.8 million meaning that uh, we have consumed 74.5% of what we have received. And when we look at the coverage, we stand now at 25.13% of the total population. And I need to clarify here that um, as Africa CDC, we are using the total population as the basis for our calculation. And we are aware that um, quite a number of countries are using eligible population uh, for calculation, and we'll explain that a little bit more um, um, in the in the in the coming um, uh, paragraphs. So um, this twenty five point one three percent represents just about three hundred and fifty million Africans being fully vaccinated, and uh, this is a very huge achievement considering the challenges that we faced with vaccination for COVID nineteen uh, on the continent. For boosters, we stand at 2.9%, and this is just about 40.5 million people on the continent that have gotten their booster shots. When we look at the countries, we see that um, 13, that is one three, uh, 13 of our member states have vaccinated more than 40% of their total population. Um, and um, to this end, um, we have also made calculations of 12 member states that have vaccinated more than 70% of their eligible population. And eligible population is um, uh, calculated based on uh, each and every country, what they have put down as eligible. And um, uh, my colleague, Roma, will explain how in Zambia, they have made that calculation. But for total population, um, 13, one, three member states are above uh, 40% to date. What we are seeing in the different uh, countries and as far as COVID-19 vaccination is concerned, shows us that um, um, members of the public are actually willing to take COVID-19 uh, vaccines, so long as we make it easily available to them. And this is very good for the African continent because for a while there's been debate whether we have a significant uh, vaccine hesitancy or not. Our evidence shows us that when we take the vaccines, 
to the public, they take them, not just the initial doses, but also the booster doses, doses as well. And we see the largest numbers of um, vaccination uptake during either mass vaccination campaigns or when we have targeted campaigns across uh, the continent. And we are very pleased uh, with these uh, results. Looking at our Saving Lives and Livelihoods um, initiative, we are currently actively implementing uh, this initiative in 12 of our member states. And cumulatively, the SLL initiative has uh, facilitated over 6 million doses of vaccines um, uh, being uh, directly from um, uh, the uh, SLL uh, initiative. And um, we uh, continue to expand the, the um, uh, reach of the initiative into new countries, part of the reason why we are here in Lusaka uh, this week. We are very pleased with the progress that we are making uh, when it comes uh, to the SLL um, uh, initiative. Let me add that um, although we have facilitated 6 million of our doses uh, of vaccines to go into people's arms, uh, the SLL initiative is also supporting all vaccines, wherever they have been uh, procured from. We provide that support to our member states. So the SLL um, uh, initiative is rolling out uh, very, very well. That is the first public health um, uh, event uh, of significance. Let me now quickly run through the other three. Uh, the second is uh, the Ebola virus outbreak in Uganda. Since the last briefing we had last week, we have documented five new confirmed cases and seven new deaths um, have been reported. This is an 82% decrease in the number of new confirmed cases and also a 53% decrease in the number of uh, new deaths. Um, this is also very good news because the trajectory um, uh, is on the decrease, something that um, we um, yeah, are very happy about and is the result of the very active community engagement that uh, the government of Uganda has been um, uh, conducting across the country, not just the affected districts, and also the very key support that partners, including Africa the CDC, are providing to that particular response. Cumulatively, from the beginning of this outbreak, we have seen 136 confirmed cases and 53 confirmed deaths. Unfortunately, um, uh, our health workers have also been involved. We have um, lost seven health workers and um, 18 of our health workers have been uh, also affected. Um, and also very important to note that uh, the age group 20 to 39 years of age is the one that is most affected because they account for 58% of the number of cases and also 49% of the number of deaths. So roughly half of uh, all the cases come from the 2039 year group. And as you know, in Africa, this is the most active age group when it comes to socioeconomic um, activities. So it is affecting a part of the society that is extremely important for our development. Um, we continue to um, do contact tracing, and to date, 92% um, of the contacts that have been identified um, as needing follow-up are being followed up, um, and um, recoveries are also continuing, which is very good. Um, in fact, two of the affected districts now have not had um, any new case uh, for the last 21 days. And uh, we are uh, uh, quite uh, hopeful that uh, we are reaching a turn in of events in as far as Ebola is concerned uh, in Uganda. Um, the two uh, candidate vaccines that were to be tested are undergoing final um, regulatory evaluation. And uh, any time now, we should be in the field to test uh, these new vaccines for specifically for the Sudan um, strain of the Ebola virus. As Africa CDC, we continue to support the government. We are uh, very actively involved in uh, uh, with village health teams. Uh, these are the, one, the uh, members of the public that have been trained and they go into the communities to ensure that understanding of the Ebola virus, how it is transmitted, what role we can play as members of the public, 
uh, in reducing its transmission. This information is then provided uh, to members of the public. We are keen to see this outbreak come to an end as soon as possible. The third public health event of uh, significance that we'd like to share today is the multi-country monkeypox outbreak. Since the last brief, we have documented new cases, 331 um, and uh, one new death um, in four countries um, uh, across uh, the continent. This is a 33% increase in the number of new uh, cases uh, that have been uh, confirmed from last time. And uh, when we look at the past four weeks, we also see that there is an average increase of 38%, which means that there is a, a, a potential increase in transmission. Um, but looking at our data carefully, uh, this we are... attributing to closer surveillance public so more cases are actually coming please but it may be that uh, more cases are now being brought uh, uh, which existed uh, from before cumulatively from the beginning of this outbreak we've had uh, 174 deaths in 13 uh, of our member states um, our negotiations around um, availability of uh, vaccines for um, uh, monkeypox are uh, proceeding quite well and uh, we are looking forward to having those being made available on the continent as soon as possible. But as Africa CDC, we continue to build capacity for laboratory uh, diagnosis, including provision of um, uh, test kits uh, as required. Finally, the fourth public health event of significance that we'd like to share today is the multi-country cholera outbreak. Um, with the flooding that we've seen, particularly in the Western part, um, uh, of uh, Africa and some of the countries, the central part of Africa as a result of um, uh, a lot of rain in uh, Niger, in Nigeria, Cameroon, DRC, and a few others. Uh, cholera cases have gone up. And since the last briefing, we have documented now 5,903 new cases. Um, and um, we've also unfortunately documented 102 uh, new deaths in, this, in the four countries of Cameroon, DRC, Malawi, and South Sudan. Um, we attribute this increase to the flooding and uh, the humanitarian crisis that we see in parts of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the continent. Uh, cumulatively, um, for cholera from the beginning of uh, this current outbreak, we have documented uh, 60,038 cases. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we have documented also 1,044 deaths across 14. Uh, of our member states. Not a very good um, uh, situation to be losing, uh, especially young uh, children uh, to cholera. Finally, um, before I invite um, uh, Professor Roma Chilengi to uh, give us an update on um, uh, the Zambia situation, I would like to share with you um, a few announcements. One is just to repeat that the Conference for Public Health in Africa Registration is open. We are looking forward to as many as um, um, possible to join us in Kigali, 13 to 15 of December, uh, for this second edition of the conference. So please uh, do register and come uh, to the conference in December. Second is um, the Bingo Initiative. We had a call for the Eastern Africa region, very good turnout. We are in the process of um, filtering through um, the thousands of applications that we received. We can only be able to accommodate 100 binguas per region. And uh, for the Eastern Africa region, um, we are going to be uh, finalizing the selection and the trainings are, uh, are slated for 20 to 27 of November uh, for the binguas and immediately we'll deploy them uh, to their communities to increase uh, vaccination rates for COVID-19. The second region will be the Southern Africa region. So in another week or two, we will be making an announcement for young people in the Southern Africa region to also apply to become binguas within their own regions. Third announcement is um, the reason why we are here in uh, Lusaka, uh, Zambia. Um, we are launching a regional initiative for the Saving Lives and Livelihoods uh, 
uh, program, and I will uh, then transition this to Professor Roma Chilengi uh, to let us know about the preparations for this very important event, and then also update us on the situation of Zambia uh, for COVID-19. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmed, and uh, good, good, is it morning yet or afternoon yet? Good morning, uh, colleagues uh, from um, those who've tuned in from all over the continent. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, share this uh, um, platform to give some updates. And um, let me begin with the um, COVID situation. Um, as a country, we've experienced four distinct waves for COVID, and we are really at the tail end, if not the end of, of the fourth wave. Um, I think like everywhere else, we were uh, afflicted uh, initially with the you know, alpha um, variant, uh, beta, uh, then the third wave with the delta was the, by far the most uh, deleterious for us. Um, we suffered a lot of uh, clinical consequences from the third wave. The fourth wave having come with the Omicron uh, variant driven almost exclusively by the Omicron variant has uh, actually seen more cases um, reported of COVID at its height. Uh, we had at some point a weekly test positivity rate hitting 36%. Um, something that was never achieved even with the painful uh, Delta variant. At its worst, it did hit 32% uh, positivity. Um, but in terms of the hospitalizations and deaths, we've actually not experienced as much during the uh, fourth wave, and we've been quite lucky. Um, I think that we attribute uh, perhaps to the fact that the Omicron variant itself is not is said to not be as uh, uh, virulent as the Delta, but also to the fact that we ramped up our vaccination coverage and uh, a lot of our people, uh, uh, the, 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 the fourth wave found a lot of our people already vaccinated. So we have no doubt that the vaccination has helped tremendously. Now, um, concerning the vaccination, COVID vaccination in Zambia, uh, we are very grateful to the partners, um, really on top of the list, Africa CDC and uh, many others who bilaterally support us. Um, it's been a very um, tough journey, uh, starting from uh, last year when we launched the vaccination drive in April and uh, uh, really faced with the same challenges that most countries across the globe faced uh, in terms of the myths and misconceptions. Uh, whereas in the beginning, when there was shortage of vaccines, we thought that when we make vaccines available, people will literally be queuing up uh, I think that was faced with a lot of challenges. I think everybody understands um, myths, myths, conceptions, uh, uh, some level of hesitancy. But I think, as uh, Dr. Ahmed said in his opening remark, we also very quickly learned that uh, vaccinating adults who are healthy was different from little children. And it was clear that we needed to take the vaccines to the people. And when we took the vaccines to the people, they responded. Um, particularly when we went in advance with uh, uh, fairly um, aggressive um, communications and advocacy, um, then be followed by uh, reasonable acceptance for people to be vaccinated. But obviously taking vaccines to people uh, is quite costly and quite engaging in terms of the campaign mode that we've had to take on. And to this effect, we've had to implement several waves of campaigns, um, really starting with 7th October last year, when our head of state realized that after six months since the launch of the campaign, 
we had hardly hit 3.3% of the target population. Now, Dr. Rament referred to the target population that we need to be specific here. Our target population at the time we began vaccinating, like everywhere else in the world, it was only adults, 18 years and above. And uh, that was our initial target. Uh, but shortly thereafter, uh, by end of November, beginning of December, we had data to show that uh, vaccines were safe in younger children and that we had sufficient logistical and other preparations to include children um, down to 12 years. So by the end of December in Zambia, our target population were everybody from 12 years and above. Um, and that really very quickly translated to a Zambian population of over 12 million people. And um, um, in the successive campaigns that we've instituted, uh, we've been uh, quite fortunate uh, that we managed to hit 75% coverage of the target population. Um, as at last week, we were celebrating 75%. Um, as, as, we see, as we sit today, we are specifically at 76.4% of the target population. So uh, this achievement is one that I think is worth celebrating, as we did last week. Um, I think it is one that is worth acknowledging the tremendous support from our partners, uh, in this case, um, Africa CDC and other uh, um, uh, donors and contributors that, that we could not have achieved anywhere near anything significant to what we have uh, if it were not for that support. Therefore, we are incredibly grateful to Africa CDC, um, particularly in the beginning when we had practically no access to vaccines and the various initiatives that were embarked on that really made it possible for us to access uh, these uh, vaccines, uh, the AVAT initiative, the COVAX initiative. We want to recognize the important role that, that our mother body in Africa CDC uh, played to bring these vaccines available to us. And um, I'm pl pleased to say that in Zambia, we have uh, uh, tried our best, uh, sitting at 76.4 today, I think has been a, a quite an interesting journey. Now, with that said, I would like to, to report that um, when we take a closer look, Zambia has 10 provinces. Um, seven of those provinces have achieved um, close to 90% coverage and above a couple of them. Um, some of our provinces, three of them, have actually not yet hit the coveted 70%. So the 76%, 76.4% achievement is a national picture. Uh, that is to say we still have work to do. Uh, we still have uh, some of our provinces including Lusaka, where we are sitting today, that have not yet hit the mark, and uh, therefore the work continues. Um, I also want to um, report that, that when we look at the age distributions uh, of the people that have been vaccinated, uh, we can still do better. Uh, some of the remaining fractions are really in our uh, 12 to 17-year-olds, uh, they, are, they haven't done as well as the uh, 18 to about 60 or so year age band. Um, the above 60s also, it's a bit of a struggle over there, but I think you can understand Zambia is largely a young population. We are quite concerned with the uh, gaps that are remaining in the 17, 12 to 17 year old bands. And I think uh, the focus moving forward will be targeted at some of these key pockets that we have to vaccinate. Um, this uh, really brings me to 
uh, the conversation about the event. We are looking forward to uh, tomorrow. This is the launch of the Saving Lives and Livelihoods Initiative. Again, very grateful and honored as a country that we would be um, the, the hosts to launch this uh, initiative. But uh, perhaps rightly so, uh, because I think we have demonstrated commitment to the vaccination drive on the continent. And I think we've scored uh, fairly meaningful achievements in pushing the numbers. And so it is appropriate, really, we feel, that the launch is done here in Zambia. And uh, I think to demonstrate that commitment, the launch is being uh, uh, led and officiated by uh, the head of state himself, I think, who is not a stranger to public health emergency matters. Um, so we are very, very honored that that, that will be taking place tomorrow. Um, a lot of activities around that event with our parliamentarians engaged. Um, and I, I think very quickly, if you will, just a comment that, that what we have learned in the COVID vaccination drive is that you have to be multi-sectoral. You have to get everybody on board, and more so our leadership structures. In this case, Zambia really had to embark on a multi-sectoral approach really championed and coordinated from the vice president's office with the council of ministers, um, the permanent secretaries, and then the uh, operatives on the ground. Uh, so much so that each campaign drive had to um, really invoke on that council of ministers and their line ministry activities to support the campaigns. And I think this is one model that will be uh, uh, advocating that others in the region who may not be as uh, as lucky as we are to achieve uh, the numbers that we have, uh, that they consider uh, utilizing a multi-sectoral approach using the aligned ministries and other stakeholders uh, to push the, uh, uh, the vaccination campaign. So tomorrow we will see some of our parliamentarians taking a walk in the interest of saving lives and livelihoods. Um, we will receive several speeches and then the president will uh, launch. But one thing to uh, recognize and appreciate is the in Bingwa initiative. And I think for us, as I said in, earlier in my statement, that um, having recognize the gap in the 12 to 17 year olds. Um, it is going to be the focus of our activities to make sure that this key age group is completely vaccinated as we move forward. I'm uh, mindful that with the launch tomorrow, uh, will also be some bingwa activities with young people motivated to take on this challenge. Um, we hope that in the spirit of the launch of the Saving Lives and Livelihoods, in the next 100 days, we can have some very focused activities that particularly target this age group. So we are hoping that uh, we will capture the attention of a number of our young people and also the multi-sectoral span that will be either following on the ground or watching or listening in. Um, to conclude, I would really like to thank uh, all the um, delegates that will be participating tomorrow, but particularly the Africa CDC in its leadership and uh, uh, in its pushing forward this agenda that the launch is, is done here in Zambia. And just to recognize our Africa CDC colleagues that we work with here in Zambia from the Regional Coordinating Center, I must uh, report how pleased we are working closely with our colleagues here. And uh, that I think if we continue at the rate we are going, I think we have much to celebrate in future. I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Aroma, for that. And um, uh, Nick, we give it back to you so that we can facilitate uh, uh, some discussions with uh, uh, those who are online. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Professor 
Uh, I think uh, colleagues you've heard a very sustained um, set of information being shared with you. As usual, we will give you the detail of uh, the director's um, update regarding the, the public health emergency. We'll share with you through our media channels that we normally use, so you can look forward to that. Uh, and even the video footage of this uh, briefing is going to be shared with you uh, later today, as we usually do during the week. Uh, let me also inform you, colleagues, that there are several channels through which you can send questions, as usual. First, you can use uh, the Zoom platform. There's a raise hand icon at the bottom of the Zoom platform. If you want to come to us through a, a live means, you can raise your hand. We recognize you and permit you to ask your question directly to other of the speakers. Uh, you can also use the option of the Q&A on the same Zoom platform, write out your questions, just as our colleague Judith Akodo and uh, James Macheri Cheget has done. We're going to be reading the questions quickly. And then we have the third medium, which is the usual WhatsApp number medium, which is uh, plus 251-94550-2310. Let me read that one more, plus 251 9455502310. So you can send your question through all of these mediums and then we will be able to forward to our panelists. So let's take our questions coming through on our Q&A uh, platform on the Zoom. First question is from our colleague Judith Akoda from the KBC, that's the Kenyan Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, I received, uh, good morning, Dr. Ahmed and uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Roman. I received this information from one of our WhatsApp uh, groups and conversation and would like to find out from the acting director of Africa CDC if it is true. And the information is symptoms of the novel coronavirus Omicron variant, which is Omicron XBB variant as follows. It do not show signs of coughing and no fever, but there are other symptoms that are joint pain, uh, headache, neck pain, upper back pain, pneumonia, and generally loss of appetite. And she goes on to describe how the Omicron viral uh, uh, variant operates five and say is more toxic uh, than the Delta variant and has a higher mortality rate than the Delta variant. So uh, she describes how it works, but her issue is, is it true that it does not show the symptom of coughing and of cough fever, meaning the Omicron XBB variant of the COVID-19 virus? Over to you, sir. No, thank you, Nick, and uh, th thank you, Judy. Um, the range of symptoms that um, we have seen with uh, this virus, including all its variants and subtypes, is quite long. The, the list is large. And um, uh, there is no uh, classical way of saying it is only this that will tell you that you have uh, COVID. It manifests in very, very many different ways. Um, the key is for our clinical uh, personnel to have um, a high index of uh, suspicion so that a test is done as quickly as possible to identify if someone is actually suffering from, uh, uh, has been infected with the uh, Omicron, whichever variant uh, or not. This is what is key. Um, the mortality rates, in, in fact, the, the, the clinical consequences in general of uh, Omicron has been changing. I think uh, uh, Roma has um, just um, explained to us how during the different waves, the clinical consequences were different. And Omicron has been uh, the kindest um, uh, variant um, uh, so far. So the clinical consequences um, take a little bit of studying to be able to uh, say which type um, has the higher mortality than the other. But at, at this rate, uh, the newer variants, it is early days, and uh, we are still collecting information globally, uh, especially where it is um, uh, more prevalent in the, in the global north, uh, to be able to see if there are any significant differences uh, between uh, the different variants and uh, and subtypes. In, indeed, uh, there are also mixed infections between different variants and different subtypes. So um, we are still gathering that evidence, and for now we cannot be able to say uh, which one. Um, uh, if the new um, uh, uh, illnesses we are seeing are related to one particular uh, type of uh, variant or uh, or subtype, 
I think the key message here, Judith, is there will be many symptoms. Our index of suspicion needs to be high enough to test quickly so that we isolate um, uh, those who uh, may, may be diagnosed as having uh, uh, COVID. Uh, and secondly, uh, the methods of prevention are the same, irrespective of which variant, irrespective of which subtype. And we need to be taking care of ourselves through prevention, uh, which is much, much better uh, than waiting to see who falls the most sick and then uh, um, uh, those who may actually end up losing their lives as a result of these new um, uh, subtypes and, and variants and mixed infections that uh, we are currently seeing. Thank you. Thank you, Director. A very uh, detailed uh, sort of answer in there. Uh, so we go back to the Zoom platform, the Q&A section. A second question, still director, directed at uh, Dr. Oman. Uh, this one is from James Macheria Chege. Uh, James is from Reuters, uh, based in uh, Johannesburg. He said, uh, Dr. Oman, on the Ebola outbreak in Uganda, when are the vaccine trials expected to start? And the second question, what are the preparations being carried out for the tax? That's uh, James Macheri Chegir from Reuters. Well, thanks, James. Um, I did indicate in uh, uh, my brief that uh, there are two candidate vaccines um, that are being considered for uh, trials in Uganda. Uh, and these are very specific to the Sudan strain of the Ebola virus. Uh, time Timelines we cannot be able to give clearly now because uh, the protocols are undergoing the finalization uh, by the authorities there. It is going through uh, the necessary uh, regulatory approvals. And soon as those regulatory approvals have been completed, then we can deploy the candidate vaccines for uh, clinical trials. Uh, we are awaiting the Minister of Health uh, to uh, be able to share the good news that the, the regulatory processes have been completed. We cannot go to the field until the regulatory mechanisms have been completed in the country. So a little bit more patience. We are uh, 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 quite um, hopeful that in the coming days, um, this uh, should have been cleared, but we must wait for the minister in uh, Uganda to make that pronouncement. Back to you, Nick. Okay. Uh, thank you, Director. Yes, thank you, Director. Uh, so, colleagues, we're still taking questions. Uh, we know that we started uh, a little bit late, so we're going to give uh, a five minutes additional time window so that you can give in uh, the questions you have. So, the platforms for the questions still remain the same. The Zoom platform, either through the raise your hand, you come to us live, or you use the Q&A, uh, where there are additional two questions follow up from Judith. Uh, both from the COVID and Ebola thing. But Jude, we'll come to you. Let's take a question from our, uh, our WhatsApp platform and let's acknowledge our colleagues, our national media colleagues in Zambia, uh, currently in the room with the subjects. Uh, this one is directed as at Professor Chilingi. Uh, it comes from uh, Jean Malu Mama Simalumba. Jean Simalumba. Sorry if I, <laughs> if I have difficulty in pronouncing the name. Uh, and Jean is from... Zanes, that's Z-A-N-I-S, she says, how prepared is Zambia in terms of preventing diarrhea disease as there is cholera outbreak in Malawi? That is for Professor Chilenge. Um, thank you, uh, Jane, for that question. Um, extremely important. I think uh, you had... Uh, the mention of cholera among the four important outbreaks that uh, Dr. Ramed uh, referred to. For us here in Zambia, we've been aware of the situation um, in the neighborhood, and uh, we've actually gone out of our way to um, address the issue in terms of um, the commodities that would need to respond to the um, cholera problem. I must say that we've done quite well mobilizing commodities. We've actually gone to all the border districts in this country, the districts that are bordering Malawi, 
and we've actually done the training of the frontline health staff. Uh, we have uh, begun to deploy the commodities in terms of, uh, you know, the chlorine, the some of the uh, test kits that will be needed to screen and test are already in the districts. Uh, we've, we've, as I said, we've trained the frontline teams, and uh, uh, now we are preparing to actual uh, to have actual sort of uh, uh, potential um, admission centers. Should we have any cases, uh, so in terms of um, heightened awareness, uh, I think that we we are in that red state um, as a country, particularly in the border districts. I, I think that we are reasonably well prepared. Uh, the one thing that would have been critical to our preparation would have been to run a pre preemptive vaccination campaign, an effort which we tried to uh, uh, engage with. But unfortunately, we have global shortage in the cholera vaccine stockpiles. Uh, um, and therefore, uh, uh, we are keeping our eyes and ears open on that front. If we had vaccines, we would have gone on to vaccinate in those uh, 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 bordering areas as a preemptive measure, but we don't have those. So we, we actually have heightened the self um, uh, preventive methods, uh, including you know a promotion of hand hygiene and uh, self disposal of waste, and also encouraging our people, should you have any symptoms, to quickly get to the health facility and mention that you are having diarrhea. And uh, in the um, heightened awareness, uh, should the case present with diarrhea, they, will, they should be able to screen quite rapidly with uh, against uh, uh, cholera. I think we have also um, triggered heightened awareness in the uh, 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 transition posts in our border area. But uh, we also recognize that between our countries, there's quite a little bit of free movement. And so our communication and awareness activities are targeting those areas. So we are pretty much uh, 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 ready. Uh, we are also in almost constant communication with our colleagues in Malawi and trying to see how we can join efforts to uh, work together to make sure we mitigate this. And I think the key issue that uh, we've been learning from Africa CDC is that with most of these infectious diseases, you are not safe if your neighbor is in trouble. And so we have to join hands with our colleagues and make sure that uh, they, they is calm over there. Thank you. And Nick, let me add um, the vaccines uh, portion to that. Um, vaccination uh, during cholera outbreaks are uh, very critical in keeping uh, the affected populations from uh, uh, going down with the clinical consequences. And um, uh, as Roma says, uh, the global stockpile is almost empty. We've been engaging with the, um, the, uh, the relevant institution globally, Gavi, WHO, uh, to see how do we ensure that we have increased um, production of our cholera vaccines. And this speaks directly to um, our new public health order, pillar number three, local production. Um, uh, with time, we do not want Africa to be waiting for um, vaccines doses to be manufactured elsewhere. Um, we intend uh, to expand production of different vaccines and other health products that are important for uh, our continent, here on the continent. That way, we always have uh, what we need uh, ready. But at the moment, uh, globally, there is a, a shortage. Manufacturing needs to be ramped up to be able to cover because the rains are here with us in many parts of Africa. And uh, with any um, uh, rainy season, uh, a small uh, collection, as it were, of water for whichever reason, including flooding, is going to uh, put us at high risk of uh, cholera. And we are discussing with the uh, global mechanisms how to ensure that we have uh, adequate stocks of um, uh, cholera vaccine um, in the coming months so that we are not losing people uh, when we could be able to protect them with this very important tool called the vaccine. 
And I must congratulate Zambia for uh, taking the regional approach uh, rather than just the country approach. Uh, you don't do these things on your own. And if you do it with your neighbors, it becomes more effective. And as Africa CDC, uh, we are very, very supportive of that. And we'll continue to engage with all the affected countries, including their neighbors, to ensure that uh, uh, we are well prepared on the continent. Thank you. Uh, thank you both Professor Rahman and uh, Dr. Oman. Uh, like I said earlier, we have uh, now is three, three follow-up questions from the two previous colleagues. That's Judith and uh, James. So let's start with Judith first. Judith is both on Ebola and uh, COVID. So a follow-up to the COVID question on the Omicron variant. So she said, my follow-up question, does it mean that more variants and subtypes of COVID-19 are still developing? Um, Judith, that's a question that um, is difficult to answer. The nature of viruses is that they change into different variants and different subtypes depending on <clears throat> their survival uh, mechanisms. So we cannot be able to say something will come. We hope it doesn't uh, because we understand what we have now. Um, and um, whichever one comes, we hope is not going to be more severe in as far as clinical consequences are concerned. Um, and also we hope that we don't get any variant that may end up being difficult to test with all the current diagnostics uh, that we have. Um, um, but the nature of viruses is that they change. They throw up different variants, different subtypes every so often. Uh, so it's difficult to say what will happen uh, going uh, into the future. Thank you. May I add to that, uh, Dr. Ramit? I think that insofar as we do not get zero positivity, um, uh, the, the risk is, is always there that you could get new variants. I think the, the, the key issue for us is let's do what we can now that the numbers are going down and let's push this thing to zero transmission. That's the only way we can be 100% sure that we will not see new variants. I think even when we are having 1% positivity, it tells us that there's some replication going on. And insofar as there is replication of the viruses, um, a mutation can easily happen. And in theory, you can end up with a new variant. So I think let's all work towards pushing back towards zero transmission. Okay, Judith, that's a very key point for you, pushing towards zero transmission. Uh, the follow-up questions, the last two we have, uh, they're both from Judith and James uh, Chege, uh, but they're related to uh, Ebola in Uganda, so I'm just going to blend both of them. Uh, Judith says, kindly update us on the ongoing Ebola situation. I think that was <laughs> uh, the second update in terms of health emergency, uh, but the question is, is it on the way to being contained. Uh, then James' follow-up question is, uh, Dr. Omer responds on Ebola in Uganda, what are the two vaccine candidates being considered for trials? So Judith is like, is the, the, the outbreak being contained or is it on the way? And uh, uh, James wants to know what are the two vaccine candidates? Over to you, sir. No, thanks, thanks, Nick. And let me start with James. James, um, the candidate vaccines that are going to be cleared are the ones that we are going to make pronouncements about. So um, we allow the regulatory mechanisms in uh, in Uganda to go through that process. And uh, whatever they approve, we will speak about it. Right now, everything is on the at the proposal stage. So um, I'll um, um, wait until the regulatory mechanisms have cleared them, and then we can let you know exactly which, which ones they are by name. Um, Judith, um, the situation uh, of the Ebola virus outbreak in, uh, I mean, outbreak in Uganda is under control. And um, I say this with the sensitivity it deserves um, because each and every case that has been identified can be connected to a previous case. Uh, it means that there is no wild transmission um, uh, which cannot be able to be connected with cases that we had before. Um, the, um, the, the numbers are uh, also relatively stable in terms of how many cases we are getting out of one contact um, that has been um, uh, confirmed. 
so in this way, it is under control. It is not over, but it is under control. And uh, our, our work in Uganda is to keep it that way and eventually uh, to um, uh, completely bring this outbreak uh, to a stop. Um, in as far as um, uh, the evolution of the, um, uh, this outbreak is concerned, it rests on what we as um, public health uh, agencies and authorities do, and also what members of the public will do. If we follow the protocols that we know work, then we'll bring this outbreak under control sooner rather than later. If we don't follow the protocols that we are supposed to, uh, to use as uh, public health agencies and as members of the public, then it will become a challenge. Right now, we have uh, this particular outbreak uh, under control. Thank you, Director. I've been, I've been uh, scanning our virial uh, question platforms to see if we have new questions coming in. Uh, so far, we've exhausted the additional uh, five minutes that was given. So colleagues, thank you very much. A very fruitful and in a lot of uh, information shared just within the one hour period. So this time I'm going to go back to our panelist, starting with uh, Professor Raman Chilinga. Uh, Chilingi. He's going to give us uh, the final maybe two points that you want the people from here to carry away, maybe a message to all of the member states in the region, your neighbors, regarding the launch tomorrow and all of the activities. And then we'll come to Dr. Ahmed. So Prof, it's over to you. Your final key points that you want the media to, to spread out to the population in the region, over to you. Um, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and for the um, listeners. Um, I would say that um, while the... The, the push and the fight against COVID is seemingly under control. It is not over yet. And um, while we have a lot of goodwill to support heightening uh, these measures to prevent the problem, I think we need to take advantage and uh, utilize the goodwill and the support to push back against these uh, uh, public health threats. Um, I think that uh, the launch tomorrow um, is yet another symbolic activity that must give us impetus to push further. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. The voice of Professor Roman Chilingi. Uh, he's the Director General of the Zambia National Public Health Institute and Special Assistant to the President of the Republic of Zambia on Health Matters. So now we go to our host, our usual host, Dr. Ahmed Ogwa Ouman. Uh, Director kind of gave us our usual three points, me, Kim, points for the week. Over to you. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Nick. My three points um, are this week. I will start with COVID. Um, vaccination works. So let's get out there and get vaccinated. And uh, wherever you see um, our being was, the young people engaging, uh, please support uh, their work. Vaccination for COVID-19 works. Second point for today is on Ebola and um, the um, outbreak uh, in Uganda is under control. Uh, secondly is we are working very closely with Uganda's neighbors, those connected by land, by water, by air, uh, so that um, we have good surveillance in place. Um, and um, uh, so far we are very pleased with the way that um, uh, the situation is being uh, handled uh, in the country and the way that the neighbors have also prepared themselves um, uh, for any eventuality. So the Ebola virus disease outbreak in Uganda is um, uh, under control and we are working to try and end it as soon as possible. The third is on cholera. The rains are here. Um, we know what needs to be done. Uh, Africa CDC will work with all affected countries, but to members of the public, our message is that uh, cholera is preventable and um, uh, each and every government has produced clear messages of what we need to do uh, to keep away from um, uh, contracting uh, uh, cholera. And uh, we need to keep to those protocols so that we bring this particular multi-country outbreak uh, to uh, a stop. It is possible to do if we engage with our public and if the public do uh, their role uh, as well. Cholera is here 
but we can be able to stop it by having uh, the right information and doing the right things um, at the right time. Thank you very much uh, for uh, today's brief. Okay, so colleagues, there you have it from our two panelists, the host, Dr. Ahmed Ogwa Uhuman, uh, Acting Director of Africa CDC, and of course, Professor Roman Chilingi, Director General of Z and PHI, there giving us lots of information for the week. Uh, let me just end with the announcement. The uh, Southern Africa SLL launch, that's the Saving Life and Livelihood Initiative launch, is tomorrow. Lots of activity in Lusaka, as you heard from the pr professor there, including, of course, His Excellency, the President, is going to be a part of it, and other members of parliament and councils of ministers. Then, of course, uh, the CPHIA conference 2022. Uh, registration is on. Check the conference website, check Africa CDC website, register. You can be a part of a huge initiative just by African, for African in the scientific community. So thanks to all of our colleagues, first to our panelists for making time for us. We actually ran extra time today. Our colleagues on the ground in Zambia making preparations for tomorrow's event and bringing us the video footage from there. Thank you. Thanks to our AUC colleagues. Thanks to all of the colleagues working in the background at Africa CDC to bring you our weekly press briefing. Join us same time tomorrow. That's 12 p.m. East African time for, not tomorrow, sorry, next Thursday. It's a weekly press briefing next Thursday. We will see you again until then. Have a best time and all the best to the Zambia launch tomorrow at SLM. Thank you very much and goodbye from us. Goodbye.